Tonight, uh, we have a speaker who's going to speak on a subject or on the way of researching a subject, uh, unlike anything we've had before in the, what, 15, 16 years of these talks. Uh, Professor uh, Catherine Moore, she is practice professor of anthropology, um, one of the other two practice professors of, um, at um, Penn, of anthropology, I take it, are, is Joe Biden. So he's in very good company. <laughs> Um, and she is undergraduate chair of the program in anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, her subject, before menus, cookbooks, and writing, reconstructing cuisines from the archaeological record. And uh, up till now, we've had speakers who did research uh, odd ways. Um, Nobody does, was doing culinary history in the 14th century or the 8th century. People were doing military history, uh, history of the arts, uh, diplomatic history, but most of the research by many of, of the people who have spoken in this series was done by looking at paintings and looking at tapestries and reading entries in journals, very interesting novel ways of coming up with the information and figuring it out. Uh, but now we're talking about history uh, before the first written recipes that we know of, which were around 1700 BCE. Uh, what, what was going on in the previous 10,000 years, and how do you figure that out? And uh, Professor Moore and her colleagues use the remains of food. They do chemical analysis of food. Um, and um, she may I explain it, um, the spatial organization of landscapes to think about what people ate. Um, she's done a research in and written extensively on ways animals and plants were domesticated um, during the prehistorical period, and I think with a special emphasis on work in South America, Central Asia, and Iran. Uh, she's currently teaching, according to the the university bio, a course on food and fire and food and feasting, um, and I will be coming down and sneaking in to audit. So please welcome Professor Catherine Moore. Thank you very much. I appreciate the kind introduction, and I appreciate the interest that you all have shown by coming and by leaning with such dilated pupils over that beautiful tray of cheese and fruit by becoming so convivial with only a tiny amount of wine at your disposal. And I think that this speaks for itself the fundamental interest of this topic to any group of people who have lived long enough to prepare their own food, even a few meals. So I uh, am going to, as, as Peter said, I am going to be um, taking you on a little bit of a journey, I bet a lot of you have read that book about the history of the world in seven drinks, for example. Oh, come on, you guys are like, that, is, that was a fun read. The history of the world in seven glasses, taking it from wine to Coca-Cola with stops on like coffee and cider and stuff like that. Um, anyway, I am a prehistorian of food. I'm going to be starting with the historic record to kind of connect with some of the things that are, I'm sure, already familiar, familiar to you, either because you're very sophisticated people around food or you eat food, because we embody these food traditions with the choices that we make, with the way we have learned how to eat them when they have presented them to us, with our ability to digest them. And we, ex we exemplify all of this history that I'm going to be talking about by choosing and assigning meaning to and taking pleasure in these foods. So when we find these foods in the archaeological record, we can kind of put ourselves empathetically in the place of the people who would have prepared those foods, who would have served them, who would have eaten them, and then ultimately would have pitched out the remains so that an archaeologist many years later could find it and work it up. So this is a very famous image. This is the, the peace side of the standard of Ur from the um, Meso Mesopotamian lowlands. And I'm 
here, one of the reasons that I'm here and I know that I'm not, a, I, I have already been scooped by someone who went to the big party last weekend, is that the Middle East Gallery at the Penn Museum opens, its formal opening is tomorrow, and we are so excited about having some of the greatest art historical treasures of the ancient world um, back on display after a hiatus of a couple years. And for example, if you've been dying to see the funeral regalia of Queen Puabi, it's back. It's fabulous. Um, but the really important thing for me is that some of the work that we were able to incorporate into these new galleries represented work that's going on today at the University of Pennsylvania Museum and around the world on putting the food history on the map with the rest of political history, military history, artistic history. Food's really important. And this, we're in kind of a food moment now um, that people are very open to the idea that even though food is fun and tasty and necessary, that it's also important. And I think that I share that uh, general sense with the rest of you. So for example, here, and I'm going to see if I make the thing work, on the left-hand side is our exhibit of a very famous early wine jar, about a 25-gallon jar, that at one point was the earliest evidence for the use of wine in human history. And it's now been superseded by a similar jar that's even older, but it's held its place for a long, but like that's not all. We also have laboratories, as you can see on the right, where we are replicating the operational sequence of making wine. We are empathizing and experiencing every part of that process. You can see here that a group of mixed undergraduates and graduate students came into the laboratory and took off their shoes and socks and stomped on grapes, not just for the, like, like the, the light bulb went off in each head as they stepped into the bins of grapes. Ugh. You know, this is incredibly slippery. Who knew it was going to be so slippery? Who knew it was going to feel like that on my toes? This would have been a very general experience, like five, six, seven thousand years ago. Um, but the other experience they had was being able to take samples of each one of these steps for scientific analysis, um, subjecting it to different kinds of tests. And we have a fabulous new microscope that lets us very um, confidently match different parts of the preparation sequence with the things that we can find in the archaeological record. Oops. There we go. So what about that early cookbook? Um, there are two very early texts here. This on the right-hand side is uh, the frontispiece of Hannah Glass's um, The Art of Cooking Made Plain and Easy. And this is a very important work. I think a lot of you who are interested in food history have probably run into this. It was one of the first systematic cookbooks. It was one of the first cookbooks that told you what to eat what, with what at what time of year. Had little menus, um, suggestions, fascinating suggestions. Uh, a chapter on captains, what captains for sh on ships should know about taking provisions along, what to eat during Lent, what to feed sick people, how to put up stores of tasty things for later in the year. Um, it gives us a picture of a large part of the production, the distribution, the kind of apportioning of different kinds of food across the year in a way that we um, are very, we can always kind of channel into. On the left-hand side here is the earliest text which qualifies as a cookbook. This is a Babylonian text from the, it's in the Yale Museum right now, and it is an account of what foods are good, and it is particularly distinctive in the, the kind of epigraphic history of cookbooks, in that it talks about both how you cook something and what you cook it with, and it's an account of how you make a lamb stew, and how you flavor it with coriander, uh, mint, and garlic. So who wouldn't want that? Yeah. Um, but we need to go further back. This is like, this is our jumping off point for understanding what it is that we can know about those culinary traditions. So I have just a few pictures just to kind of set the stage because you guys love this kind of thing. Um, we are interested in the relationship of different food combinations and the artifacts that are typical for serving them or preparing them. And on the left-hand side is a classic uh, 
combination bread and milk, which makes a lot of sense to us in the West, but certainly there are a lot of places where neither bread nor milk would be served either to an adult or a baby. This is something that we really, um, we've kind of elevated this kind of food, but it's not necessarily the solution to a universal human problem. On the right hand side is a classic chocolate pop, one that is uh, set up to prepare chocolate with a little cake. And like, who doesn't know, love that as well? But I think a lot of you know that that is a combination of foods and a combination of technologies that comes in indirect translation from the original history of chocolate in Mexico, that the same preparation of chocolate, and in fact, if you drew that little um, wooden stick out, you'd see a little bird mixer that's a dead ringer for the what we see the Aztecs using in the, epic, the art historical record of ancient Mexico. But putting it together with a little sweet cake is like, they would have really wondered what we were all about. So that being able to establish the connection between artifacts and foods is important. And we also want to keep our eye on the perennial issue, which the great anthropologist Jack Goody presented to us, of the difference between everyday food and elite food. We really want to know by this, this uh, organization of space, if I can go back to one of my uh, original premises, we want to be able to know where we are in space in the archaeological record to be able to associate certain kinds of food with the universal feeding and the universal tastes and the universal um, textures of food that would have been characteristic of a particular place. And then we want to be able to be, have s enough spatial control, sometimes down to the individual artifact of when very special food is being served and consumed. So what are some of the techniques that archaeologists use to attack these issues? we do rest heavily on the food traditions of contemporary societies because every contemporary food tradition is a solution that works to some universal problems and to some well-known crops and plants. We, when we've got the cookbooks, we read the cookbooks. Don't let me, uh, don't let me give the impression that I am immune to the uh, appeal and the amount of information that's packed into a cookbook, especially one that, for a cuisine that I don't know very well myself. And then there are art historical images, and there are ones like the paintings I just showed you. We spend many moments scrutinizing the most unprepossessing art historical images, looking for, and I, I have an example from an early wine jar. Um, we, we want, if there's information there, if there's a symbolic value to a particular food in a particular place, we're on it. But we can't stop there because there is so much of everyday life which mounts up in creating the way of life that we all share that isn't uh, attended by an explicit symbol or, or manifestation. I'm not doing very much tonight. I do reference a little bit, but the genetic variation in foodstuffs around the world has proved to be another extraordinarily um, rich archive of information about the past. So information about, the, for example, um, the breeds of sheep and goats that are, are present from China to Britain now tell the story of the history of goats um, going back to 7,000 BC that we can, yeah. <laughs> uh, someone, someone had a skeptical, uh, uh, gave me a, shot me a skeptical glance from the front row. This is work that allows us to connect different aspects of genetic variation to the nearest common ancestor to known breeds. And when we pull these things back, we can see political and economic history in the writ large, in the contemporary distribution of traditional animals. Um, we are still, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll just tell you where, where this is coming in. The physical variation in the living apes and humans is an important piece of information to us because it kind of sets the stage for what our possibilities were as a species from the very earliest part of our evolution. And the example that I have here is a, um, a little detail that came out about 10 years ago now um, on the diet of some Neanderthals from Iran that were totally disruptive to our model of what we think our early human ancestors were eating. And that's important. We're ready to be disrupted by evidence because the stories that we tell just based on what we do now and what we like now uh, are unreliable 
avenues to the very, our very deepest past. And then something that I have been involved in and I find continually fascinating and productive are the residues that we can recover from different kinds of archaeological artifacts. Pottery is the primo um, artifact for retaining this kind of molecular archive of food use. So we can get wine out of pottery, we can get beer out of pottery, we can get butter and milk products out of pottery. Now you may think, sure, you know, after 50 or 60 years I can still get that out, but can you do it after 7,000 years? Fascinatingly, the answer is yes, and we make very productive use, and we've, uh, we've really, again, learned new things that we did not anticipate by being able to push a familiar artifactual record in a new direction. So, the two things that I'm going to be talking about today, which are of uh, kind of themes that I'm going to be uh, developing, are, the, are being able to pick apart the process of growing and preparing a food, and then our ability to reconstruct some finished dishes. Now, does anyone remember the great British theme that is being exemplified in this little picture? Does anyone recognize this little icon? Prince uh, King Alfred burning his cakes. Ah, oh, come on, guys. This is a, 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 a fable about the first unifying Saxon king of England, and he was incognito in some peasant woman's hut, and then she leaves him to like do some cooking, and he's incapable of doing so, and he burns the cakes. Now, here's the thing. As archaeologists, we don't have a lot of access to every piece of bread in Saxon England, but we totally can find the burned stuff. That <laughs> carbonized material is something that we have developed an extraordinary eye for, and we are increasing our ability to um, develop stories and identification of exactly what's going on from these residues. And I'm just going to set you up. They don't look as good as I make them sound, but it's really important stuff. Okay, so here we are in the Center for Analysis of Archaeological Materials at the Penn Museum. This is my colleague, um, when the red lander, my colleague Chantal White, whose work I am going to be leaning on heavily in this discussion. She's a paleoethnobotanist. I'm a paleozoologist, and so we collaborate on a daily basis, both in teaching and in research, on putting together the foodways of the past. She's always pumping up the plant side, and I'm always pumping up the animal side. We do a lot of other stuff um, in CAM as well. We have a program in digital archaeology, and you can see here that the students in the, 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 the introductory class spend a lot of time reconnecting with um, uh, traditional crafts and replicating and understanding the technologies of the past by engaging in those processes themselves. And this is something that in immediately gives them greater insights into the work that they're doing with, uh, America, with um, museum collections. Chantal and I consider food to be a craft. We consider food to be an important technology. And the way that food hits the archaeological record represents that technology. So and that's why I'm like, so we've got a student, you know, making a little votive figurine. We also make students um, break bone, grind grain, do all of the things that people did hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, which they are still connected with both genetically and culturally. So the part of the archaeological record that's hard is almost everywhere where there's ever been water, oxygen, or a temperature change. Everything else is really easy. Um, and so I'm going to show you two contrasting aspects of our understanding of the history of flavors. On the left-hand side of this slide are a series of very well-preserved, very old spices. There's some very old garlic, some very old almonds, a very, very old peppercorn, the little thing that looks like a tiny coconut is a cardamom pod before it broke, breaks up. And then this big jar, which like I would have said, anyone would have said who's familiar with the, the distribution of amphorae across the Mediterranean world, that's a wine jar. It was not a wine jar when it was deposited because it was full of cardamom seeds. And only by looking can we find this thing out. But um, in fact, some of this work is associated with some of the stuff that my husband did when he was an undergraduate working at the site of Husayr al-Qadim on the coast, the Red Sea coast of Egypt, 
Karanis is a site in the, uh, just on the edge of the delta of Egypt. Both of these sites are famous for their extraordinarily well-preserved food remains. And these are familiar foods to us. We all love these tastes now, so we kind of lean forward and to say, oh, pepper. I couldn't live without pepper. Um, and in this case, the archaeological record yields up information on the distribution of how this material would have been produced in the Indian Ocean, come up the Red Sea, been dropped in the, on the coast of the Red Sea, transshipped across the eastern desert, gone down the Isle, and s gone down the Nile, and then spread through the Mediterranean world as high-value trade products. Maybe even in a leftover wine amphora. On the right-hand side, at the top, are some of the best evidences that we have for the domestication of the chili pepper. Now, it doesn't look like I put a little modern chili pepper here to kind of encourage you to see the connection. Um, this was extremely painstaking work by my colleagues Linda Perry and Sonia Zaril. They took samples of soil from a lot of early formative sites in Mexico, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. They digested the sand and filtered out the organic material and got a slurry suspended in a heavy liquid that they could put on a microscope slide that would retain only starch grains. And these are the starch grains from some of the earliest chili peppers in the archaeological record. We don't have chili pepper peduncles. We don't have chili pepper seeds. We don't have chili pepper fruit cases. All of that's gone, but lurking at an extraordinarily fine density were the starch grains that were left after these ubiquitous crops had rotted out 1,500 years before the Common Era. These were some of the earliest domesticated crops in Latin America. And in fact, we believe that maize wouldn't have been such a big deal, that people wouldn't be eating corn all over Latin America. Like, who wants such a pasty, bland foodstuff but when you get chili peppers with it, then you really got something. So for this reason, because burning and the fixing as a carbonized food product is such an important part of the archaeological record, we spend a lot of time burning stuff up. So this is a picture of me and two of my younger colleagues huddled over a fire made out of cattle, dried cattle dung in a place where we work in Bolivia. And we had tucked in that fire um, were a series of foil packets of different kinds of food, and then I put a little sprinkle of broken animal bone there as well. We just wanted to start understanding at this elevation with the very low oxygen pressures that are um, typical of being at like hmm, 13, 14,000 feet, how hot the fires got and how likely it was that they were going to completely consume or leave some kind of a charred carbonized residue. And I, I turned it into a little archaeological site the next day, cut through the middle, took my trowel, I scraped off the burned material, and then uh, 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 these little chunks are the bone that I left there, um, not burned at all. The, the ash itself turned out to be an excellent insulator. And in fact, the thing that came out of this was like, you know, we can have a pretty big fire but we're not necessarily going to be preserving any plant remains. Like, hmm. um, I had a student some years later um, exploring. She's, uh, Julia is holding a, uh, my favorite household tool, a handheld uh, infrared pyrometer. And she was keeping track. She laid out individual little cups of seeds of different taxa across this sand bed, built a fire on top, and monitored the, the um, temperature across it to try to get a more nuanced idea of which seeds would be likely to be preserved in this way in the same assemblage and which kinds of seeds would tend to burn up or not burn at all. And that has been a, an extremely valuable piece of insight for us as we try to understand the distribution of some minor but uh, locally important uh, crops in Eurasia like millet. So the, 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 the push that we're putting on right now in the food archaeology world is cooking. And this means that we have to really be creative in understanding all of the ways that a food could be cooked and understanding how soaking makes a difference, how germination makes a difference, how fermentation makes a difference, even if we're not 
familiar with fermented a particular food, we know that fermentation is important because of cheese and wine and bread. But we want to be able to understand how that might have transformed foods in other ways. So these are experimentally sprouted and then charred lentils. And up here are experimentally soaked and then charred chickpeas. And down here are some Bronze Age chickpeas. The difference between them, like why is the Bronze Age chickpea so well preserved? Because it hadn't been cooked. If we were looking at cooked food residue, it would have popped open and we would have seen a flaky inside like this. And so this gives us a feeling for when we're looking at a food store that had never been cooked versus something that is likely to represent a finished dish so that the combination of those foods would have a very significant relationship with them. So what about bread? In the West, bread is the staff of life. And I'm really into bread. One of my favorite foods, I will just tell you that the, er, the oldest piece of toast in the archaeological record, another one of my favorite foods, actually is very recent. The earliest toast only dates to about the 1780s. Um, the earliest roll versus the, a very common form of um, Roman bread. So what do we got here? We have uh, the bread from Pompeii, as you know, dates from the very early um, part of the first millennium and is an oldster compared to this bun from Germany. And then recently, and this was just shows you how careful um, uh, scientists are, a bunch of Swiss archaeologists and chemists discovered and published an exhaustive analysis of the oldest bread-like object. <laughs> they said, okay, this is so old. Um, it's Neolithic. I think it's like 2300 BC, which is old for this region. It was found in a waterlogged context, so it was available to us because um, it was deprived of oxygen, even though it was very wet. The Swiss lake dwellers left us all kinds of cool stuff. We know about their fishnets. We know about their apples. We know about their nuts they ate. And incredibly, chunks of a bread-like object. We don't. Why, why you might not want to use the term bread is there are a lot of different grain foods on the, t on the table. Here we go. We, we have a hard time breaking away from these metaphors. They said it had a hole in the middle, but we don't want to call it a donut. Um, they subjected it to a chemical analysis, a genetic analysis. They cut through it and measured the vesicles in the structure in order to suggest that it had been leavened with yeast because of how many openings there were in it. And they came down to the supposition that it was a leavened, ground, grain product that had been round and there was a hole in the middle. And then they, because they were, they didn't want to add any more kind of cultural weight to it, they refrained from calling it like a bagel or a donut. But just think world's oldest bagel, even though we're not going to go there. So there's lots of little bits of bread in the archaeological record. Here is some bread at the Penn Museum. Oops. Um, these are the size of fists. And the kind of the cunning thing about this is, again, these are available to us, and they're not charred because they were very, very, very dry. But we see images of bread that let us show how important bread would have been. In this offering table here, um, we see kind of a little, like those placemats you give little kids to show them where to put the fork and the knife and the spoon. This is an offering table that tells you where to put the wine, how to pour it so that it flows through this little opening at the top. How the five little buns, no, eight little buns, eight little buns in a row there, the lotus. You can see the water or probably beer or wine flowing out of these spouted jars, places to fill. And some of them have, and since I work mostly on animals, um, you can see like here's where to put that haunch of, of of mutton, like put, put, your, put your leg of meat right here. So we see this as evidence for important combinations. We can't actually very often put these kinds of foods together in this um, 
distinctive way without that kind of help. We're always pushing a little harder on the identity and the um, variation that we see between the evidence for particular crops. So because we know we're going to not call things bread unless we know they were really bread, I'm going to show you some experiments that we did with um, millets. And as I said, we're trying to develop the archaeology of millet as a, a kind of a, a way of showing what might be missing from the archaeological record and to suggest what things may have been important in the past. So this is a flower pot on the left-hand side. And the thing that looks like a blob of millet is a blob of millet porridge. Then there's a, the two preparations of millet that we experimentally carbonized. And then I've shown you some um, highly magnified views from um, the lab specimens. So the interesting thing about this, and something that, I, that my um, student maintains, even with further research, is extremely important, is that the porridge on the top was fermented. And the porridge on the bottom was cooked, just water and grain boiled to make the seed coat soften. And then the, the starch burst and uh, kind of get syrupy in the, in the vat. You can see that the fermented porridge has a different texture, that there's a lot more starch that has been released from the grain, and that it's kind of a, um, a glossy texture with very few remains of the porridge. I think this is really important. We know that. Fermented grain products often, especially for kids, are more nutritious than fresh grain products. That it's the nutrients are less bound to the fiber, that they, the vitamins are more available to the human gut after fermentation, and that often uh, the health of children in areas where fermented porridge is the weaning food is better than the ones where they're eating an unfermented porridge. What became clear to Julie McLean when she was doing this research was that there's a smell that goes with it. It's a smell that reminds you of milk products fermenting. It's a smell that reminds you of different aspects of a wide variety of good foods that kind of have that kind of a little bit of an acetic, alcoholic kick that that would speak to you as a kind of goodness and remind you of the way that people prepare foods and achieve good times with foods and achieve good health with foods. So that if the smell is missing, then you know that you're not where you need to be with your cooking technique. And she's working now among contemporary pastoralist people in Kazakhstan. And when they move from being settled, um, being nomadic people in outlying camps to being settled in um, apartment houses and, and other settled places in the emerging cities of Central Asia, the way they know they're not like on top of their game is that the food smells wrong. It doesn't have that kick. They're not fermenting in the same way, even if they have the same ingredients in their house. It isn't the same because the same cooking techniques aren't being used. So I'm very uh, aware of this because one of the things that she has claimed is when you lose the porridge smell, at the same time you're probably losing some of the fermented milk products that would be produced in the same households. So there are a couple of different kinds of wheat that are important in the archaeological record. The two top solutions to wheat here are um, einkorn and emmer wheat which had, you can see have a longer, we're looking at just individual grains once they've been pulled off the stalk, and the rounder, plumper bread weights at the bottom. What I'm going to show you now, I'm going to take you through a little bit of, of wheat evidence. Some of this comes from my joint work with Chantel and some with um, my joint work with Naomi Miller, of the, also of the Penn Museum. So just knowing what these crops look like lets us assess what the cooking processes normally would have been that would be the most uh, likely to have followed from being able to raise these kinds of crops under several different kinds of water and soil conditions. And the bread wheat, as you can imagine, is the one that you'd always choose to make 
bread with because it has a thin seed coat. It allows you to get a floury, fluffy product relatively easily. And it doesn't store as well because it, it, it loses its little um, taffy coat. And so when you gather it up after threshing, you've got a bunch of um, naked kernels that need to be stored in a more intensive way or the rats and bugs will get, get in them. In fact, you can see that the bugs got into these seeds at the bottom. The reason that they have holes in them was that in ancient times before they were carbonized, they were full of weevils. So we know that this was a constraint upon people being able to use the fruits of their labors. They must have cared about uh, managing different crops under different kinds of conditions with different kinds of culinary ends in mind. So we do see signs of the processing of threshing. You can see the little bits of the, the um, wheat stalk here that were ripped off the, um, ripped off the, the stalk of grain as the, as the seed loosened. And then you see these little weevily ones. We've done, some we've done some work with our students so that they can help us get further to understanding when we have really well-preserved specimens, what we can do with them. So here is a grain of wheat which we have grained on a, we have ground on a lateral mortar uh, uh, with a motion like this, back and forth, back and forth, hopefully to produce a floury product. This would be the kind of tool that that would go with. And then on this side is a series of grain samples that were produced when we pounded. And this would be typical if you've had the kind of the emmer or the icorn that still has a little papery cover on it. You'd, before you needed to process it for food, you'd be ending up pounding it in a mortar. Boof, 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 boof. It, it, like you won't get what you want by going on a back and forth motion. And we were able to create a um, signature with the modern wheat grains that let us feel that we would know when grain had been pounded in this way. We also know that it is less likely that flour or bread could be produced from, from uh, wheat that it produced in this way. So just this semester, uh, Chantal and I have been returning to the site of Ereba in Turkey. This was a pen project in the 1960s. And by the kind of the mischances of inventory control, we ended up with a very small set of samples that we could subject to analysis. And I just want to kind of walk you through what we did um, with that. This was work that we um, pulled the samples, and then our students did the work. So this is what Ereba looks like today. Um, the, I guess I should have said that this is the part of south uh, western Turkey. It's a lovely area and one of the first parts of the Middle East outside of the Holy Land um, to uh, be the place where Neolithic um, farmers first lived. So it doesn't look like that much. It looks like kind of a hump on the side of the road, but it was chock-a-block with um, archaeological remains. So here is some of the architecture that was revealed. These are tiny little rooms. There are little rooms like this one, which probably were for storage. And there are bigger rooms that were probably family um, dwelling places and workplaces around open courtyards. And three kinds of wheat were already being grown back at 6500 BCE, which was a really fun kind of thing for us to um, intersect with. Our students were so excited. There they were bent over their, their microscopes, like, wheat, wheat, I can see it. I can tell what kind I have. And it was really very cool. So here's the wheat. Um, we had a couple clean samples, and then we had some samples produced in a, a more rough and ready kind of way. This is what they look like, like just like a hundredth that size. You could, you could learn how to do it yourself. But even more exciting were these little guys here, which are the spikelet forks. This shows us exactly where we are in the grain production process. This is the kind of thing that you, the last thing that you try to get rid of before you process the grain. These are the little things that are the, you remember how when the little red hen had the sheaf of wheat and she was taking it to the grinding, um, the, to the mill, it had long prickly awns on it. These are the little bases of those awns. So here we basically, if you can kind of like channel the little red hen, um, this is not the little red hen about to make bread. This is the little red hen putting aside um, grain for the winter. 
and it still has some of these processing parts in it. So as the animal specialist, I didn't have a lot to add to this because the, the sheep and goat remains were very obvious. There were a few cattle remains. There was um, some wild stuff too, and that was exciting for me to be able to say, you know, you guys are village people. You're sitting there trudging around, graining, raising, raising three kinds of wheat, spending all this time processing it, and then making your bread and your porridge. Um, but there was a lot of bird bone, and there was a little bit of fish bone as well. So that kind of gave me a sense for how the small amount of wild food that was still available would have been an important supplement, and I think an important taste supplement as well to kind of lighten up what already by 6,000 BC would have been kind of a predictable diet. So the, well, the one thing that I want to kind of uh, put in here is that there's more than one way to live off the grain staples that we're familiar with today. That we have the possibility of fermentation of a liquid project like beer. We have pretty good evidence for when bread was an issue because we have the bread wheats, we have the bread mold, and we have our bread-like object. Um, but we also have, now that we have presented, now that we have prepared these um, charred porridge samples, we're starting to see it in the archaeological record. And even people who were doubtful at first, when they said, ah, you know, I have this kind of puffy, crunchy stuff. I don't really know what it is. And then we said, well, you know, well, we'll send you a picture of what we've got from our porridges. And it was like, oh, um, this really has made a difference. And so that's very exciting. And there's noodles. Um, these are the world's oldest noodles. <laughs> they are really old. They're, um, I think they date from 4100 BCE. They were found under a plate in a jar, and they were subjected to very fine starch analysis, and there were proof that they were made of millet. So that's a very cool thing that we now have. We can demonstrate here all the different ways that a cooked food can come out of domesticating very similar crops. Way before domestication, we are now being able to control the importance of grain foods in the human diet. This is material from the site of Ohalo II, which is a, just a spectacular but minuscule set of three households on the coast of the um, Sea of Galilee. The declining lo levels of that lake um, revealed stuff that had been underwater for 20,000 years. And this is a, uh, the, the scale's not too easy to see here, but this is the foundations of what would have been a brush hut that the ancient pre-farming peoples would have used. In the middle of that hut was a grinding stone. On that grinding stone, very careful work, was able to pull off starch grains of plants that later became domesticated, but were not domesticated at this time, suggesting that it's only the 10, 15,000 years before our time that gets us to our time and lets us see how people have been kind of fiddling with and solving some of these same culinary problems um, the whole time. This is the toothware on the human body that was excavated at Ohalo II, and it was not what people were anticipating. This is another one of these disruptive situations they said, this looks like the diet of later times. It doesn't look like he was sitting there like crunching on hard things. It was a fibrous diet, but he was like kind of tearing things apart in the way that the people of the, the early farming period and even after that looked. It was like it's sort of a, another way of kind of connecting with people who had already solved the problem before our way of life. And then this, I promised people really early material these are the teeth of some um, Neanderthals recovered from some very famous cave sites in Iran and stuck to the edge of the calcified tartar on those teeth were starch grains of barley. This was the truly disruptive piece of data. Um, of course, it tells us Neanderthals did not brush or floss their teeth. We're kind of like, we're, we're ready for that. But, um, we always said that eating grain food was something that came much later in the archaeological record, just because we couldn't find any. 
Now when we have a kind of tissue and a kind of sample and a kind of technique that lets us kind of pull that out, we're really uh, thoughtful in a new way about, okay, we know that from the early farmers that grains were important. We know that from the late hunters and gatherers grains were important, but of course they couldn't have been important earlier. And now we have the Neanderthals munching on starch and, and I'm not going to evaluate this, the archaeologist who worked on this said the starch was cooked. It's like, ooh, how would they have done that? No pots, no stone bowls, no baskets. How are you going to do that? So we haven't figured that out. I didn't present that to you. Don't tell anyone that you heard that from me. <laughs> it's cool enough that we can find a foodstuff in a place that's 20 or 25,000 years older than it should be. Okay, so now earliest wine. This is work that happened at Penn a long time ago in the 1970s. Uh, uh, scientists by the name of uh, Patrick McGovern uh, pulled, looked at this big jar and ground out some of the inside of one of the sherds and subjected it to infrared analysis and then to GC mass spec to find tartaric acid and then a tree resin which is often used to flavor and in some cases um, preserve different kinds of wine. So that was very cool. These layers are before a lot of different things had already, before the time of cities, before the time of kings, before the time of, I, at that point, we thought this was before the time of milk. Um, it's not, but it was a very evocative uh, transition to a kind of food processing that is still important to all of us, as we have demonstrated this evening, and probably represents something that we've been doing from the apes. Taking a sweet food, rots out a little bit, we eat it, we like it. So we can find containers in a lot of different places. Sometimes we don't exactly know what they're for. This is the new earliest wine. It dates to about 500 years earlier than the previous earliest wine. This is actually a big jar. And I put the same guy, Pat McGovern, did the um, work on the inside of it. A thick walled vessel like that. You can see there's a lot of place for stuff to soak in and kind of get stuck on that very um, absorbent clay. And this um, shows you just how big a jar it is. So you're not gonna you're not gonna cook in a jar this big. You're not gonna like bring water from the well in a jar this big. And what people say, this is the part about um, kind of grasping for art history. Knowing that there was grape wine in this jar suggested to the archaeologists that maybe this is a picture of a human figure with their hands raised up harvesting grapes. You, you decide. This is what the, um, at this point we're going much further than we did not just marker compounds, but being able to establish their um, proportion and their relative proportion matching the proportion of a known sample. That's not all. They also pulled out pollen, a starch grain from grape, so grape pollen, a starch grain from the fruit, and then a fruit fly's leg <laughs> in the same sample. Just kind of the ecology of it was like, yes, I know what it must have been like back 6,000 years before our common era. Um, we have gone further at Penn in trying to pick apart the process of grape production, accepting that wine was very early and accepting that a lot of um, the trade in wine was so important that there are a lot of productive area and a lot of organization of craft was involved. This is the work of Chantal White at the site of Numera in Jordan. And I direct your attention to this one room here, which is in plan view here. Lots of um, jars that were smashed um, when the roof fell in and a huge conflagration. So we've got great carbonized pre preservation of the kinds of things that it would have taken. So here we are back in the lab squishing because we wanted to develop samples like this one which is the squished seeds, fruit, and tissue of the fruits after they've been stomped on because we want to see that in the archaeological record. And we do. Um, these also are puffed out ancient grapes that 
when we match them with attempting to um, match it to every known grape product, turn out that they're much better matches for raisins than fresh grapes. This probably was a raisin wine because it would have let them make wine more months of the year than if they were looking at fresh grapes. So we've got other constituents. We think we know what some of the spices were. Um, what some of the flavors of these wines might have been. That's very exciting. And I'm just going to, I thought maybe some of you guys have met the dean of the engineering school here, a guy named Peter Bogutsky. He was um, instrumental in putting cheese on the map of archaeology. Now, butter has been available to us through gas chromatography and mass spectrometry for about 15 years. It's very exciting to be able to see new evidence for how early and how important dairy foods of all kinds were. People kept saying, well, dairy, dairy, dairy. Are we talking about, um, are we talking about yogurt? Are we talking about cheese? Here's what the dairy evidence looks like. You map the stable isotope ratios of two fatty acids within a sample that you've recovered off the ceramics, and then you match it. Is it a match with lard? Does it come from a pig with different digestive system? Does it match with the body fats of ruminant animals like tallow, or is it matching with the dairy fats? And when we get all the points popping up in the butter category, we know that we've got an intensive dairy, um, uh, an intensive dairy uh, technology and economy. So the kind of the big split in the world between the societies that are resting on a yogurt type product and a cheese type product represents probably the history of human technology, human control of different kinds of animals that can be milked, and human ability to deal with lactose in dairy products. And the two products have different histories, and we really were not able to cope with cheese. So the fact that these early, very early pots from the linear band ceramic period of Poland and Germany looked a lot like cheese sieves, a place where you'd put um, curds and whey together and then they'd kind of soak through and then you'd have the cheese and then you'd put it in some kind of a form and then you'd wait for it to cure. Looks like this was what they were for. And in fact, when they pulled the lipids off these cheese things, they were full of dairy products. And so we think, yes, this is the evidence earlier than we thought um, for uh, cheese in Europe, the kind of the European tradition of cheese, which we've just been out in the hallway enjoying, probably dates to about this period. So I'm just going to say that we never turn off this kind of thinking. Um, these are oysters from a historic house on the Penn campus that we're starting to work on. Along with the oysters, we have the good flavors of the beef. We have the good flavors of the mutton. We have the implements, a silver spoon and then a bone-handled spoon with an iron, um, a bone-handled, uh, probably a fork, though, man, I don't know. Um, we always are trying to see these things together as a meaningful set of foods, tastes, recipes, and decisions. And I feel, I make the claim that this is an extremely important part of our shared history as people. So thanks very much.